Hi, uh, welcome to Brown Bag History. I'm Kathy English, curator of Revelstoke Museum and Archives. And uh, today we're going to be talking about Brown uh, Big Bend prospectors. As we start, we uh, acknowledge the land traditions and culture of the Sequipmic, the Tanaha, the Snipes, and the Okanagan Nation Alliance. We acknowledge our use and inhabitation of this land sacred to these four nations. We respectfully honor their traditions and culture. So again, you know, I've got a big topic today. We're talking about Big Bend prospectors. And uh, just to put that in a little bit of context, the Big Bend is the region that's uh, referred to as the, the area between Revelstoke and Golden, north of, of Revelstoke, following the, the bend of the Columbia River. And uh, that area came into prominence in the 1860s when there were gold discoveries made and there was a short-lived gold rush. When I say short-lived, I mean, the main action was taking place in a period of two years, 1865 and 1866. And after that, there was subsequent mining in the area, but um, it never reached the, the heights that it did <clears throat> in the gold rush of the 1860s, there was estimated thousands of people that came into the area. And of course, realizing it wasn't easy to get in there at the time, there were two basic routes. There were a couple of trails from the uh, Shushwap Lake, Seymour Arm, uh, over to the Columbia River across the Monashies and then across the river into the gold fields or there was uh, routes coming up south from the United States. And there was even a steamboat built to bring uh, people up, prospectors up from the states, the SS-49. That's another talk for another day. Um, it, even after the, the gold rush, the Big Bend remained a important mining district for many, many years. And I believe there's still companies that own mineral rights in the area now. Naranda had a copper mine there in recent years. So it's always been an area of interest in terms of mining. This is a little pan, probably picture probably from the 1890s, showing some uh, plaster gold that came out of uh, the French Creek mine. So we're gonna talk about some of the personalities that were involved. Of course, um, you know, working as a prospector was kind of a, tended to be kind of a solitary job, especially for they'd be up in their cabins for, for months on end. So it really attracted you know, a certain kind of person who liked that, that lifestyle. This was one of the early miners we have, and we only just have this little sketch of him, but his name was JC or Monty Montgomery. And uh, he, he was very early. He was here during the gold rush days. He was born in the United States in 1842, and there was mining in Montana by 1862, by the time he was in his 20s. He moved on to one of the first gold camps in the Lower Kootenai in 1865. He was also mining in Rock Creek in the, in the Kettle Valley and in Colville. And he was actually a deckhand on the SS-49, the steamboat that came up during the gold rush on its, um, its Few, few trips, like they made a total of four trips up the uh, Columbia River. And he was working there as a deckhand in uh, 1866. Um, after that, he went prospecting up the Columbia and Canoe Rivers. And the canoe is one of the rivers that comes into the top of the bend where uh, the old uh, uh, golden cannon was. And uh, he stayed there until the fall of 1867. So he was one of the people that kind of stuck around in the area for a while. Um, in the 1870s, he was working in the Clinton area in uh, charge of cattle for one of the, the big ranches there, and uh, then spent some more time in the Southeast Kootenai before coming back to the Big Bend in 1898. So he came back to, to this area that he was here as one of the earliest um, prospectors. There was a claim named after him, the Montgomery Group of Claims, and they were uh, far up a tributary of Downey Creek. And so he was prospecting in the area. He died in, uh, Mar on March 2nd, 1938 in Kamloops at the age of 96. 
And after about the age of uh, 90, whenever he had a birthday, it was celebrated in town because living to that age was quite a remarkable feat back then. And um, the Camlets had what they called the old man's home. So uh, it was really one of the first seniors residences in the area. So he was sent there when he was no longer able to, to look after himself. Um, it, the, his obituary, it said, for a while, his family shared it in his pioneer life here, but later they returned to Colville and is not, it is not known whether any of them survived. He did have a, he was married and had at least one child, daughter named Daisy, who was born in Revelstoke in 1899. But as I said, a lot of these people, a lot of the prospectors tended to live fairly solitary lives. One of the other early prospectors was a man named um, uh, John Boyd. And um, he came to Revelstoke in the early 1890s and was a mining partner with Thomas Bain. In September of 1893, they took up a preemption of, or uh, Boyd took up a preemption of 320 acres of meadowland on Downey Creek. He established a ranch there near his mining claims, and it was known as Boyd's Ranch for a few decades after that. In, um, in, uh, there was another family living nearby, the Bain family, and um, in July of 1897, Boyd's wife, Alexina, died of a stroke at the nearby home of the Bain family, who were also at Downey Creek. She was just 26 years old. She'd been back east visiting family for a year and had just returned to the Big Bend. In um, 1902, uh, John Boyd and uh, Thomas Horn died in an accident in the uh, Revelstoke Canyon. Um, Thomas Horn was also a, a well-known local prospector who had a, a family in town. And they'd gone up the river with the intention of prospecting Canoe River for Micah. And uh, Horn had ordered a Peterborough canoe through W.M. Lawrence's hardware store. And it was made to his specifications. And it was actually noted as one of the, the best canoes on the, in, in, that people had seen in the region. Uh, Horn was one of the most experienced boatmen on the Columbia. And they'd, he'd taken a couple of people up the Columbia on the trip. And uh, he planned to return to Revelstoke to report to the government agent on the probable cost of extending the trail to Canoe River. On his way down, he picked up uh, E.A. Bradley, who was also a, a miner in the area, uh, George Laforme, who we'll be talking about later, well-known packer, C. Richards, and John Boyd. Boyd was a mail contractor at that time and was bringing down the mail. At the head of the canyon, Bradley, Richards, and Laforme got out to walk to town, not wanting to ride the rapids in high water. Uh, Boyd and uh, and Horn decided to, to go through. Horn felt that he had enough experience to get the, the uh, boat through the canyon, even in high water. But um, they, weren't, they weren't able to make it. The, the canoe uh, was disappeared. Uh, some of the men who were working on the road up above said they saw the canoe shoot up in the rapids and disappear. Um, Horn was seen to be swimming, but there was no uh, of, of Boyd and uh, both of them drowned. That was in 1902. One of the really long time prospectors on the uh, river was Alex McRae. And uh, he was born in Guelph, Ontario in 1877. He was a cousin of John McRae, the author of In Flanders Fields. He came west as uh, a young man around 1898 and worked as a steward on the SS Kootenai steamboat. Uh, he was working on trail construction in the area. He worked on both the Jordan Trail and the Big Bend Trail. Um, he also staked timber limits in the Seymour watershed with Elijah McBain, another prospector, and had a place of, place of claim at 62 Mile in the Big Bend. Uh, he had uh, a contract to deliver mail up the bend for a short period of time. I uh, did a trip of 70 miles once a month on the snowshoes in winter and carrying 50 pounds of mail on a six day round trip. Um, he just had the contract for a short period of time. Other people took it over later, most notably 
uh, Oli the Bear Westerberg, who had the, the mail route for over 40 years. And Alex was one of the people who was on the trail in May of 1902 when Tom Horn and John Boyd died and uh, watched helplessly as they were uh, caught up in the whirlpool and, uh, and drowned. Um, there's a, a note in the, the notes that we have on him, um, really kind of fascinating story. I don't know whether there's truth to it. Um, I've never heard it anywhere other in, in here before, but there was one story that he was traveling up the bend and came across a mudslide and found the opening to a cave. Inside, he saw what looked like Spanish armor. He didn't have time to investigate, but when he came back, he saw that more mud and rocks had come down and he could not locate the cave. So there's a nice little treasure hunt if anybody ever wants to go out looking for Spanish armor in the big bend. But um, chances are it's probably under the water of, uh, of the Revelstoke Dam. So there's probably not much chance that will ever be, be found. Um, Alex um, did his own canning, including corn on the cob and made jellies. He did a lot of, uh, they had a big garden as well. Um, he married uh, Gina Severson, pictured here in 1909. She came to Revelstoke from Norway in 1908. They had uh, three sons and six daughters. Up until the late 1950s, close to the age of 80, he, was, he rode his bicycle. But uh, one of his sons one day found him riding on an icy road and they persuaded him to put his bicycle away. And his uh, sons and uh, family also would help at, their, their, at his uh, mining claims. He was uh, mining at Goldstream. Camp Creek and Mile 62 on the Columbia River. His wife died in 1954, and uh, Alex McCray died uh, 1963 at the age of, of 85. Uh, their family was really well known in the uh, skiing circles in Revelstoke. They were all very involved in the, the ski club. Uh, they were the, the ones that they helped. Uh, Craig Rutherford built Heather Lodge at the top of uh, Mount Revelstoke and Don McCray managed it for a couple of seasons until Don went over seas for the Second World War and uh, died in action. Uh, they were, as I say, really noted skiers. Uh, a couple of years they did a couple of uh, long, really very long distance trips. They did uh, one trip to uh, uh, Golden around the Big Bend and then another year they did a trip to Jasper and then over to Banff for one of the winter carnivals. So certainly very well noted in uh, local skiing circles. Andy Kitson is probably one of the most well-known uh, miners and prospectors in this region. And he was born in Ireland around 1878 and came to the US in uh, 1901, about the age of uh, 22. Um, he uh, ended up in Seattle and then went to Vancouver and then arrived in Revelstoke by 1903. Um, he had dreams of uh, gold mining. He um, met Ed Bradley, who had uh, mining claims in the region and mining interests around uh, French Creek and hired on with Bradley's gang, working on the consolation placer diggings at French Creek. He also worked with Gus Hedstrom and Tom Downs on the trails in the Big Bend. But most of the people who were, were there were doing a, a variety of jobs. They were doing trail work. They were prospecting. Most of them had trap lines as well. And uh, quite often the trap lines were, uh, <clears throat> were more profitable than their mines. Uh, they could, uh, people could make quite a bit of money on, that, on selling furs. In the uh, winter of uh, 1905 to 1906, uh, Kitson was working at Standard Basin in partnership with Elijah McBain and prospecting and helping McBain do assessment work. In the winter of 1906-1907, uh, he was trapping at uh, Silvertip Falls, about eight miles north of town. And uh, <laughs> then in the summer of 1907, there was a timber boom on, so he worked on timber cruising on the Seymour River and located timber for McRae, McBain, and Kitson, and sold timber to a company, company from Buffalo, New York. So he was doing a lot of variety of jobs uh, in the area. 
1911, he took over what had originally been George Laforme's pack train. And, and by 1914, he had 26 head of horses in the train. And he worked the pack train until the spring of 1919, packing for timber cruisers, prospectors, survey parties, and trail repair work. This is uh, leading a group into the, the big band. Um, Andy Kitson is the, um, the third from the, the right, and just to his right is Alex McCray. In um, one of the talks I did last fall was about the uh, uh, Down the Columbia uh, adventure story book by Lewis Freeman, who did a trip all on the Col whole Columbia River in 1919. And he hired two local men as guides, Bob Blackmore, who's a real noted river boatman, and Andy Kitson. And uh, <clears throat> so I talked about that not too long ago and about their trip around the, around the bend. So he was a really noted uh, boatman as well. Um, in, uh, in 1954, at the age of 76, he had gone up to his uh, cabin at Carnes Creek he left there on September 6th of uh, 1954 to visit his trap lines and claims. Uh, he didn't come back when he was expected to. So a search party was organized by the RCMP and they visited each of his trap line cabins until he was found on October 19th, sick and, and close to helpless. He'd suffered three strokes, one which uh, totally paralyzed his left arm he had been forced to tear shakes from the porch of his cabin to keep warm, and his food supply was very low. His cabin was 12 miles off the Big Bend Highway, and the terrain was only accessible by foot or on horseback. A helicopter was called in, but due to poor weather, it couldn't get in for a couple of days. In the meantime, a police constable went in on horseback with supplies for Kitson and the men who were caring for him who were Joe Fienler and Bill Lorella. Finally, on October 21st, the helicopter was able to get in to pick up Kitson. Uh, they landed at the golf course, and the newspaper said that Mr. Kitson was in good spirits and apparently had enjoyed his novel trip. Bill Larilla and Joe Fineler and the two constables had to walk the 12 miles to the Big Bend Highway, and they were picked up by a police car in the afternoon. That was uh, one of his last adventures. Uh, shortly after that, he ended up in the, um, the care home in Kamloops and died there on April 2nd, 1955 at the age of, of 77. Uh, he had uh, a cousin in town, uh, Vi Morrison and uh, her family and also had a, a brother still back in Ireland. It mentioned um, there that one of Kitson's partners was Elijah McVeigh. Uh, it's Elijah McBain came from New Brunswick, who came up to this area in 1894. He had a house on First Street West and uh, was married and had a wife there. Um, he, so he was partner with Andy Kitson for quite a few years, uh, was a timber cruiser as well as a prospector and uh, a trapper. He had uh, properties above Carnes Creek. They were considered of much value uh, and had been taken over uh, by a, a company from Regina. He was on a visit to his property at Carnes Creek and uh, collapsed suddenly of heart failure and died at Carnes Creek on um, August 24th, 1929 at the age of 72. This was his cabin at Carnes Creek. You can see a beautiful cabin, little log uh, cabin, beautifully maintained. He has uh, a little wood pile out front. Uh, that's probably one of the nicer cabins up in the region. This photograph was taken by Earl Dickey in uh, the 1920s. And um, one of the reasons I'm showing you that is I wanted to compare it with this next cabin, which is not as nice. This was probably more the style of your typical prospector's cabin <clears throat> up in the bend. Uh, this was the uh, cabin of a man named Kid Price. We don't know a lot about him, um, but he was born in the U.S. in 1859. 
and uh, came to Canada in the 1880s. He was mining both at Golden and in the Big Bend. Um, he um, was eventually sent to a home in Victoria where he died in 1958 at the age of 98. Uh, but uh, this picture back in, in 1919 was his, his uh, home at the time. But there's a couple of um, the quite nifty looking homemade chairs out front almost look like the Adira Adirondack style chairs. Uh, I've thrown in a few additional photographs because I don't have photographs of all of the people that we're, we're talking about. Uh, but this is a picture showing a hydraulic mining operation in the Big Bend around 1910. We have a couple of interesting stories from some oral histories in our collection. There was a history that was collected from Doug Abrahamson back in the 1960s. And Doug Abrahamson was born in Revelstoke. His uh, father, uh, Charles Abrahamson, was one of uh, several brothers that came here in 1885 and uh, started the Central Hotel on Front Street. Uh, so, um, and uh, in the winter, a lot of the prospectors stayed at the hotels. Uh, they didn't always overwinter in their cabins. So, they would get a room at, at one of the hotels on Front Street for the, the winter. So uh, Doug Abrahamson, as a child growing up in the hotel, got to meet a lot of these characters. And he talked about a fellow named Henry Wilcox. And this is from Doug's, uh, Doug Abrahamson's history. He said, Henry was a veteran of the American Civil War. Henry was up there. He placer mined until he got too old to carry on. And he went down to one of their veterans places and he died, I would say about roughly 50 years ago. And speaking of Henry Wilcox, I was looking in one of those journals of the North. I think this fellow Liberto started this journal and Barkerville was featured a lot in it. And it showed a building like a hotel and in front of that, I'm sure it was old Henry Wilcox. So he was up there in the early days too, before he ever came to Revelstoke. In his obituary, uh, in, uh, when he died in uh, 1951, the newspaper headline said, Revelstoke Civil War veteran dies at 105. He died in uh, Wisconsin. It, his full name was Lansing A. Wilcox. And the newspaper said, perhaps only a couple of Revelstoke people knew that the deceased lived in Revelstoke for many years and was prominent among old timers in the early days. About 35 years ago, he returned to his old home in Wisconsin to retire at a home for Civil War veterans. At, uh, apparently at the age of 18, he enlisted in the 4th Wisconsin Cavalry and saw three years of service with the, uh, what was known as the Iron Brigade. And he'd been in Revelstoke probably since 1885. It seems said that he had come here during railway construction. Another story that uh, Doug Abrahamson uh, called, uh, mentioned was about a guy named Jim Hathaway. He said there was a fellow, Jim Hathaway, at today what they call 17 Mile. And that was like the first stopping place. If anybody wanted to stop there anymore and they didn't, they didn't stop there unless they had to because you never knew what you were going to get to eat. You probably got a stew, but what was in the stew, that was another proposition. But anyway, Jim was hipped on invent inventing perpetual motion. So he was downtown quite often and he came to see a machinist in town by the name of Stonex, very good machinist. And Jim Hathaway would come in and get another gear, another wheel or something like that, that made by Stonex and go up there and he was working away at this perpetual motion idea that he had. Um, and had a, he had a farm up in uh, at, uh, 17 Mile. Uh, had been in Revelstoke since the mid 1890s, had, had formerly been employed by one of the large watchmaking factories in the Eastern state. So I guess that's where he got his interest in tinkering with gadgets. And his obituary actually talked about his, um, his interest in perpetual motion as well. He said his model, which he made entirely by hand is a remarkably fine piece of work. He actually believed he had the principle solved and lived from day to day with the anticipation of placing it before the public. But he died in um, 1924 at the age of 70 in the Queen Victoria Hospital. Uh, one of the really interesting characters here was uh, Raymond Allen. And uh, 
he was working as a, a ship's carpenter, working on the Arrow Lakes boats in uh, 1894. He was also uh, trained as a blacksmith. He applied for mining claims in the Big Bend in the late 1890s, early 1900s, and worked his claims for many years. He built uh, two cabins, a root house, and a mile and a half long flume, diverting Camp Creek into Goldstream. The flume was all tongue and groove construction with no nails. All the lumber was hand cut. Alan also carved a wooden door for his cabin that was so, so outstanding that he was later able to sell it to American visitor, visitor for a large sum of money. So he was really a uh, good craftsman, fashioned his own tools as well. And in the winter, he would uh, live on a, a cabin in the Macintosh farm in the Big Eddy. He was known as a kind and gentle man and was also known for the large cat that he always carried on his shoulders. And you can see in this picture with uh, one of the Macintosh uh, daughters and there's the cat uh, around his, his shoulders. It looks kind of like the Cheshire cat. Um, he was um, known to have a beautiful gold watch with a big chain and a gold nugget on it. And uh, that was unfortunately stolen from his cabin. Uh, he grew his own produce up at French Creek. In 1935, he came to, uh, to town with uh, some gold, which he converted to cash, planning to go to Nova Scotia to see his sister, but someone robbed him. He returned to his claim to find that someone had burned his lower cabin down. He then lived in his root house. It became suspicious of everyone after that and took his gold to Golden where he converted it to cash and sent it to his sister. Sometime later, four people came to his claim, including two officials, saying that he had not properly registered his claims and that they would be closed for one year. He threatened them with a shotgun and was forcibly taken out and sent to Essendale. Excuse me just a minute. Um, yeah, so um, unfortunately for uh, Raymond Allen, he was um, had threatened uh, these people who were trying to take his claims, really claim jumping. And uh, he was sent to Essendale, which was a mental health institution in the Lower Mainland. Uh, he was released from there and went back up to his claims and waited out the year. But uh, on the day that he went to register his claims, he entered the mining office one minute after the, the hour only to be told that his claims had already been staked out by others. So that was really disheartening for him. Um, he finally died in 1952 at the age of uh, 95. Doug Abrahamson talked about him as well. He said, Raymond Allen, uh, up until the time I was around 20, he was, uh, was just a name. I'd heard a lot about Raymond Allen. He was up the Big Bend, maybe 30 miles. But in 20 odd years, he never came to town. That man built a sawmill, whip sawed his own lumber to make the flumes in order to drive the wheel that drove the saws and so on. And the only things that he bought were the saw mandrel and the saw itself. The rest was all handmade. So he could go ahead and make more lumber to put his flumes in. And he never seemed to have much money. Uh, the police eventually had to go out there and bring him out. Uh, I think a lot of people suppose that he had taken out quite a bit of gold and cashed it because there was no signs of him having huge sums. Um, and um, Rowena Meehan, who was, uh, her father was uh, Dan McIntosh and a really good friend of Raymond Allen, uh, said that uh, her father, Dan McIntosh, first met Raymond Allen while carrying the mail. Allen was sitting in the sunshine outside his cabin near Goldstream on a Sunday morning. In his later years, he spent winters at a cabin on the uh, uh, a property in Big Eddy, and then later in the little house on the Macintosh farm. Um, so um, Rowena said that, you know, it really kind of broke his heart when he was sort of uh, uh, tricked out of his, his claims. Uh, this is a, a picture just from a, a family photograph of the McIntosh family of Dan or Donald McIntosh. Uh, he was born in Ontario in 1870. At the age of 12, he apprenticed as a blacksmith 
and uh, worked in Ontario, Michigan, and Manitoba, and came out to BC in the 1890s, planning to go to the Lardo, but he uh, found uh, stayed in Revelstoke instead and uh, had claims in this region. And he um, worked for a while as a blacksmith, blacksmith helper with the CPR. He was probably one of the first, probably the first known person in the region other than indigenous people who were here early, earlier who explored Mount Revelstoke. And uh, he was the one that encouraged uh, uh, A.E. A. Miller to go up, and Miller Lake is named after Miller, but uh, McIntosh had been into the lake prior to A.E. Miller being there. So he was really the person who's responsible for introducing people into the in the community to Mount Revelstoke and what a beautiful spot it was up there. Um, he was a mail carrier at the Big Bend for about three years and worked plaster claims on the Culloch and French Creek. Um, he talked about uh, one time when he was uh, uh, heading up on the trail near Carnes Creek and he was stopped for over two hours waiting while a herd of over 200 caribou crossed the trail. Uh, he homesteaded in the Big Eddy in 1906, married, married Margaret Calder, whose father, uh, Reverend Calder, had, had had a big farm in the Big Eddy area. And uh, they had three children. One of them was Rowena McIntosh Meehan, who was well known as a teacher in town. Dan died in 1959 at the age of 88. Um, another story we have, and I don't have any pictures to go along with it, was um, uh, about a guy named Abe Butler. And we got most of this information from the oral history from Doug Abrahamson. He uh, said, um, Abe Butler was a mystery man all the way through. I very well remember when he first came into Revelstoke, just he and his dog, Pardo. Very quiet man, didn't bother anybody. And he settled in Revelstoke. He stayed at our hotel. And he was going up the bend trapping. A great man to play poker. He loved a game of poker. Well, there was one of those card sharks came into town and he stayed at the hotel. Uh, they didn't allow all night poker games at the time. So he said they would go up and play in a room. This card shark, a tall, thin fellow with a Van Dyke beard. I guess they were playing in his room. Anyway, I came in the hotel to get my breakfast before going to school this particular morning. And just as I came in the front door of the office, this man came tearing downstairs. Where's the phone? He, uh, Doug said, right here. So he goes over, give me the police station. So my ears are all cocked now for something. Send the policeman down here right away, quick. A man just pulled a gun on me. So it wasn't too long before the policeman arrived. The sergeant with the night police, he arrived down there. The upshot of it was that they had been playing poker up there and this was the last hand before they quit. It was a pretty big pot. And this crook, I suppose he was dealing off the bottom of the pack or something. Anyway, when they came to spread their hands, he reached out and said, oh, I guess that's my pot. And as he reached out to grab his arm around the pot this way, he's sitting there looking into the mouth of a 38, old Abe Butler sitting there across the table. And Abe said, no, I don't think that is your pot. The fellow didn't stop to argue. He just up and down to phone for the police. And I'm quite convinced that Abe would have shot him. Doug goes on to say, Abe stayed around Revelstoke for a while and he took on a partner by the name of Shorty Mix. And they were going up the big bend. Before they left, Abe came to me and said, Doug, you can have Pardo, I'm not going to take him with me. That was the dog, you see. I always liked that dog. So I was tickled pink, a nice fox terrier. He also gave a bolt of cloth to Mrs. Abrahams and then gave other things away as well. And Doug continues, they went up to this uh, four mile house, which originally had been a stopping house just at the foot of the canyon. And he and Shorty stayed there overnight. The next morning, Shorty went up to the watering trough to get some water to make breakfast. And while he was up there, he heard a bang and came back and here Abe had shot himself. The story behind it was this. He had been mixed up in a holdup, a, a train holdup across the line. And the posse had caught up with the gang and to get away, he'd shot a sheriff and had come up to British Columbia. And that's how he came to be here. And Doug continues, says, it could be quite true because he was a mystery man, very quiet, minding his own business and didn't talk too much to people. The um, 
Revelstoke Mail Herald of September 25th, 1915 had this uh, headline, old time trapper commits suicide this morning, puts revolver in mouth and fires bullet through head, while camping at Old Canyon House, was on way to Big Bend with supplies. That was the whole headline. Said placing the muzzle of a 38 caliber revolver in his mouth, A.C. Butler this morning committed suicide. He pulled the trigger and the bullet passed out the top of his, he his head, death being instantaneous. Butler, who is an old time trapper of the Big Bend, well known in the district, left Revelstoke together with his partner, G. Nix, four days ago. They were taking supplies to their trapping grounds in the Big Bend, but Butler not feeling well, they decided to camp for a few days at the old Canyon house. This morning, while lighting a fire behind the cabin, Nix heard a shot and rushing into the cabin, found Butler unconscious and uh, bleeding with the revolver lying by his right hand. Nick sent for help and they kept uh, Dr. Hamilton, the coroner, and Dr. Sutherland went to the scene in an automobile. Uh, Dr. Hamilton decided that an inquest was unnecessary and they brought the body to the undertaking parlor in town. So it mentions uh, in there, George Mix, um, I'm not sure if this is not a related photograph. I was, didn't have photographs for all of the people. So just put some of the photos from the big band in, in, the, in here as well. But George Shorty Mix uh, died in Revelstoke in 1950 at the age of 57. He was believed to be of Russian origin and um, prospected and ran a trap line um, in the, the Big Bend area. Again, he was a mystery man. There were rumors that he was a wanted man again. Uh, so, you know, partly because these people lived very quiet lives, it was easy for people to make up rumors about them, but who knows, some of them could have been true. Um, said that one time he returned to his main cabin and discovered that someone had broken in and stolen all his furs. He was able to track them down and retrieve the furs. Don't have a lot of details on how he got them back, but one can only imagine could have involved a gun. Um, so that his obituary in 1950 said that uh, he died in the Big Bend, uh, according to word brought to town by jo Joseph McDougall at his cabin he died. It was 60 miles north of Revelstoke. Uh, Oscar Hyron, another well-known trapper, found Mick seriously ill while en route to Revelstoke. He conveyed him to McDougall's cabin before continuing to town. And the police were going to, leaving in the morning to bring the remains to Revelstoke. So there were a few cases when people died uh, at their cabins and their bodies had to be retrieved and brought back to town. One of the interesting stories was that of uh, Alex McIntosh. And I don't, we don't know who the people are in these photographs. It, uh, so I just put it in for background. But um, Alex McIntosh came to Nacosta as a bridge carpenter in 1894. And then he came into this region and prospected at McCullough Creek and other areas of the bend. He was involved in river work and timber cruising and became a noted riverman. He was associated with freight supplies up the Columbia to the mining properties at Goldstream. Uh, he was well, well known for his uh, skill on snowshoes. Uh, they said when Alex came to town, all the others knew it by the length of his stride. Uh, and even some of the, the uh, Norwegians said they had a hard time keeping up with, uh, uh, with uh, Macintosh. So he um, died at his uh, farm, and which is his home 35 miles up the Big Bend Highway in March of 1938 at the age of 70. Um, he'd um, his wife uh, lived with him on their homestead and was with him at the time of his death. And he still had quite a few active mining uh, properties in the region and the Standard Basin and other areas and was a fur trapper as well. So there's a story in the newspaper about them uh, retrieving his body. That the remains were brought to Revelstoke on Wednesday morning by provincial constable Graham and three local residents after a hard journey, both going and coming. Much has been written from time to time of the hardships endured and the courage of the famed Northwest Mounted, but often the provincial police of the hinterlands of BC are called upon to make exploits of equal endurance. And one of these was made early this week by one of the local detachment, Constable Graham, 
assisted by Len Maley, W.E. Miller, and Ben Nielsen. Uh, at that point, the Big Bend Highway was snow covered beyond uh, 12 miles with, the, and the, the, the road wasn't completely finished by then, but uh, stretches of it were, were completed. Uh, but it was, even after they completed it in 1940, they didn't keep it open in the winter. So in, um, at this point, it said the, the highway was still covered beyond, snow covered beyond 12 miles with long stretches of hard going. They left town on the Monday at 2 p.m., taking a car for the first 11 miles. And then they went on snowshoes to the Spiker Farm, which is 17 and a half miles up the bend. And they arrived there at 8 p.m. and were met by Len Maley, who had phoned in news of, Mrs. Mac of uh, Mr. McIntosh's death from that point. At 2 a.m. on Tuesday, so early in the morning, they struck out northbound uh, while the traveling was still good on the frozen snow. They reached the McIntosh farm at 11.30 a.m. So that's nine and a half hours. And they were met by Mrs. McIntosh and a trapper neighbor, Mr. Bradley. Constable Graham and the others placed the body on a hard sleigh and hauled it for a couple of miles to a boat landing. From there, they took a rowboat owned by the Schroeder Timber Products Company, uh, which had been placed at their disposal. And um, they made a fair headway downstream and they reached the Spiker Farm Tuesday at dusk. Setting out Wednesday morning at 7.30, the more hazardous part of the boat trip, that through the Columbia Canyon, was made in daylight. And the boat was moored at the Columbia River Bridge here at about 11 o'clock Wednesday morning. The remains being conveyed by truck to Brandon's undertaking parlor. Uh, so amazing story of uh, trying to get a body out of the, the big bend. And uh, noted in the paper that Mrs. McIntosh didn't come down with the party at that time, but she was planning to come into town by car when the, once the highway was cleared of snow by the uh, public, uh, provincial public works department. Another story we have is of a man named uh, William Whitmore, and um, he died in Revelstoke in um, 1921 at the age of 77. He was a blacksmith by trade. One story goes that he was to meet the boat coming up the river and have a couple of horses ready and chewed for two people off the boat. But he was more interested in making sure that his own supply of liquor had arrived and hadn't chewed the horses. So the two visitors had to wait until dark. Then removing the stove pipe from Bill's cabin, they dropped a rope with a hook on it and snatched every bottle off the table and refused to return them until their horses were shod. And he died in his cabin 40 miles up the Big Bend. He'd been in the area since 1885. He was known by the nickname Wild Bill Whitmore. But uh, it said he was anything but that which his nickname would warrant being a man of kindly disposition. And it was believed that he had been born in 1843 in uh, the state of Maine. I lived at Carnes Creek for quite a few years following the life of a trapper and prospector and farmer. Uh, but in uh, later years, had, in more recent years, he'd been living in his uh, smaller cabin farther down the river. Um, he said he was nursed by J.C. Montgomery, who was the fellow I talked about at the very beginning of the talk and by another, another man, that an effort was made by Mr. Arthur Johnston, government agent who sent a boat up to bring him down, to have him brought to the hospital, but he passed away before the boat arrived. But Mr. Whitmore was a man of rugged physique and frequently made the 40 mile trip to Revelstoke on foot. Uh, we have this uh, photograph in our collection taken by Earl Dickey, uh, probably in the, in the late 1930s, 1940. Um, this is Gus Hedstrom. He'd uh, come to Revelstoke in the 1890s from Sweden. He was interested in placer mining in the Big Bend and timber development as well. At one time, he owned several mining properties in the Albert Canyon area. Don't have a lot of stories about him, but really great photographs. I wanted to include that. One of the really well-known characters of the Big Bend was George Laforum. Uh, he was known more as, as a, a packer, but he certainly also uh, was uh, engaged in prospecting and uh, in trapping as well. And he had uh, come to Revelstoke from St. Hyacinth, Quebec, and followed uh, 
Canadian Pacific Railway construction westward and arrived in Revelstoke in May of 1885 and immediately began prospecting and established his famous pack train business uh, by 1889. They provided supplies to miners and trappers in the Big Bend area for 16 years. Uh, this is a, one of our my favorite photographs in our collection, a picture of his uh, pack train on Front Street in 1894. And the photographer, R.H. Truman, who was a really well-known BC photographer, is standing on the roof of one of the nearby buildings to take this photograph. And um, you can, can see that the animal's all ready for, for a trip. Um, when, you, when you look at the photograph carefully, uh, you can actually see there's this one fellow who's wearing kind of a sombrero style hat and kind of a Mexican style uh, jacket. Uh, just an incredible photograph. And this was taken on, on Front Street. The white building at the far end was the Victoria Hotel. And next to that, that uh, kind of slanted roof was the Columbia House Hotel, which was the first um, hotel on Front Street in 1885. And then you can see the HN Corsier General Store. So it's still very much a bustling uh, downtown street of Revelstoke in 1894. Um, he had a, a couple of uh, disastrous uh, trips. In, uh, there was one in November of 1896 that cost him $1,500 and the loss of 27 of his pack animals. When the, uh, the, his animals were stuck in up north because of really bad weather, uh, really a freak snowstorm came up and he wasn't able to get the animals out. And in order to uh, prevent the animals from starvation, he, sh he shot uh, and he and his crew shot all of the animals. That actually happened to him twice with another time with uh, not quite as many animals, but that was really one of the hazards of, of packing was when you're using horses, horses couldn't handle the heavy snow. So uh, that, that was kind of a, one of the problems of, uh, of that trade. Um, he bought a farm near the, where the Revelstoke golf course is now around 1896 and uh, grew uh, at uh, orchards and um, he was growing cherries and apples and also strawberries. So he was growing strawberries for the local markets and also for the prairies. There were uh, crates and crates of the strawberries that were shipped to Calgary as well. Um, he died in uh, 1939 at the age of, of 78. Uh, so this, you know, this is just, um, again, just a snapshot of, of some of the, the characters. It was, um, the, the Big Bend was, at that time was a real rugged place. This was when it was the Columbia River north of Revelstoke was a very wild river. So, um, you know, there were lots of, of deaths on the river, um, lots of this kind of stories of you know, these interesting characters living sometimes kind of shady lives, but uh, some great stories. I'll probably do another talk another day about a little bit more about the, the big band. So next uh, talk is on Wednesday, April 14th, and we're going to be talking about the Columbia River. Again, a huge topic, but we're going to be talking about uh, the, the, some of the, how the dams have changed the river and what the river was like before that time. This picture on this slide is of Death Rapids, which was uh, north of uh, Downey Creek and um, came by its name because you know, a lot of people died there. Um, so we'll see you again in a couple of weeks and thanks for joining us today.